All right, good evening and welcome to Showtime TV. I'm your host, Omar Rashida. Now we're back again, we, we got it right this time. Uh, my special guest is the executive director of One Village Alliance, Sandra Fitz. Good evening and how are you? Good evening, I'm wonderful. Thank you, Brother Omar, for having me back again. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem, no problem. Last time we interviewed, uh, I was on Channel 28, so that, that was a minute ago. <laughs> yeah, it was before the world changed, but oh, yeah, I've missed yeah. you, I've missed everyone, so greetings to all. <laughs> okay, okay, so now, uh, a little while back, you, you had this vision that you wanted to uh, create an organization, One Village Alliance. Um, talk about your village, um, talk about your vision and how you came about uh, developing uh, One Village Alliance nonprofit organization. So actually, I'm really excited. You know, a lot of things have happened in 2020, but one of the big things that's happened for us is it's, uh, we've completed 10 years wow. in existence. So um, I started the organization in 2009. 2010 was our very first program year. So um, a very exciting time. We started as an education agency, but Brother Omar, as you know, anything having to do with education, particularly with um, historically marginalized youth, which is our mission to really grow um, historically marginalized youth, youth into their true greatness through education, economic development, and the arts. Um, mm -hmm. But there's so much advocacy that is a part of that. So, um, we shifted pretty quickly from an education agency to now we're a global so social justice organization. Um, so I'm just really excited about the journey where we've come, um, the number of lives we've impacted, not just children, but parents and particularly our focus on um, fathers and the lives of boys and girls. Yeah, okay, now let's talk about some, some of the main programs that, that you had established over the years. Uh, first, uh, we can go with uh, Raising Kings Conference, which is coming up in, I guess, a little less than a month. <laughs> you can it's do it every coming year. Up, coming yeah. up. It's, um, yeah, so, yeah, you're talking so, about it. Yeah, so I'm really <laughs> excited that we do have uh, Raising Kings coming up. A lot of you recognize, you see it all the time. But um, the image behind me is actually an original piece by one of our kings, um, Terrence Van, who's right. a phenomenal artist here in Delaware. Raising Kings is all about um, changing society's prominent image, expectations, and the outcomes for Black men and boys, um, particularly in the African American and Hispanic communities. So that initiative um, serves to elevate positive images and messages and narratives of black men and boys as they exist. It's not that they don't exist. They're just not put to push to the forefront. So that when you ask a young person or someone, you know, um, if they've heard, you know, these one of two places, black men and boys will end up by the time they're 25, it's become as American as apple pie, that there's these two places. And we know for a fact that there's 2 million plus places that our young men and boys are and um, where they could become, so. Right, yeah, I know that, that um, it's, about, it's about a week long festivities. Uh, you do something for like maybe four or five days and then, and then on Saturdays, you usually have the debate conference at the PS DuPont School as it has been in the past. Um, so to, to talk about the, 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 uh, the each day represents uh, a different meaning, a different program, heading up yep. to, to, to the main program. So this year, um, Brother Omar, of course, our schedule is shifting a little bit. Okay. You know, in the past, we've had up to 1,300 men, boys, fathers, sons, mentors, coaches, mothers raising sons, and even broader community members like educators and, um, you know, professionals who are invested in the community. So, you know, we're no longer in a space where we can have 1300 people gathering right, right, um, right. and you know all of these robust events traditionally you know we're in year nine and we launched at ferris school for boys um and have been there for the last you know several years um so it started as a one-day event um in 2012 which was the second um, inauguration for President Barack Obama, and it happened to be on Martin Luther King Day. So oh. our focus has always been raising the next generation of Dr. King-like leaders, 
And when we think about Dr. Martin Luther King and President Obama, we think about that kind of greatness. Um, and that has carried through to our ninth year. We're gonna launch again, as always, on Dr. Martin Luther King Day. This year, it's January the 18th with the MLK Day of Service. Historically, it's been at the Delaware Art Museum. This year, it's gonna be right here um, at our new home, which we're gonna unveil during Martin Luther King Day of Service. And it's actually the Freedom Center. It's at 31 West 31st Street. And it's an extraordinary collaboration and partnership and this exciting social justice center that's being developed in partnership with UAME Inc. And um, UAME was founded by um, freedom fighter and activist Peter Spencer as the very first independent black church in the nation. So we're making history here and we're really excited about all the work that's being done. So again, January 18th is the kickoff for Raising Kings on MLK Day of Service. And the Delaware Art Museum is still our signature partner helping to make it all happen right here at the Freedom Center. Right. The Freedom Center, is that, is, that, is that the old Five Star King in that area or is it further no, down? Oh, it's oh. not. It's, um, it's, it's at 31 West 31st Street. Okay, all right, okay, I'm just, I'm just trying and to pick only, Yeah, it's the only one in the Delaware Valley. Um, okay. It's Destination Freedom, again, a, a robust social justice center where the arts are thriving, business, um, entrepreneurship, okay, yeah. development, wealth building. We have a martial arts studio here. I'm really excited about a production studio that we just um, opened up uh, actually on Christmas Eve. We just uh, had the uh, honorable legendary Dr. Twin B. Brown um, has um, partnered with us to bring a production studio here. So, so much happening. And it's, again, it's right off of 31st and Market. Oh, so okay, okay. this is the Freedom Center and you gotta come. We invite oh, wow. you to the creative space for artists. We have studio space, gallery space. Um, we do workshops on grant writing for artists and um, young philanthropists and entrepreneurs and business leaders. Um, you know, we have learning pods for youth here. So there's just so much happening. We have a parent parlor for parents who have had to transition into their role as, um, as teachers over the last several months. So it's a great space and we're gonna unveil it during the kickoff of um, Raising Kings Week. Yeah, and speaking of spaces, I remember when, when you first started off, if, if I stand corrected, you, you were at a church in the South Branch area, and then later on, yes. you, moved to, you moved to Grace Church on Washington Street, so, 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 so now you're in another building. Well, our model, so we never are in a space, and then, you know, we're not like in spaces and leave spaces. Okay. It, it's, it's a very interesting model that um, I'm glad you asked about, because I often don't talk about it. Okay. But our whole approach since day one has been to leverage existing resources um, in the heart of communities that need us the most. So we identify, we, we identified at the very onset, you know, 10 years ago, as we were developing One Village Alliance, that instead of, you know, launching capital campaigns and putting millions of dollars into building, developing, renovating, sustaining, and maintaining building space, and then having to figure out the biggest barrier, which is how to get people there. We decided why not just partner in philanthropy? So it's not just funders, donors, and volunteers. It's also um, host sites like um, PDH Ministries, like Grace Church, UAME, but it's not just faith-based organizations, it's schools who have been our partners. As you mentioned, we've been, PS has been one of our host sites for um, nearly nine years. Yeah. Um, so we're in several schools throughout Red Clay and Christina School District, um, low-income housing communities. We've been housed in um, Bethel Villa and, you know, Harvest Point throughout the Del Delaware Valley in low-income housing communities where high poverty ch children living in high poverty um, communities, they're, they're already there. That's where they reside. Um, so schools, low-income housing communities, public libraries, um, you've been to our programming there, um, faith-based organizations, and um, just as importantly, facilities where youth are incarcerated. So these all become a hub where we've maintained a presence 
for the 10 years of our existence. Now there are some spaces where we've outgrown um, and we're just excited to now be in our most enormous facility now. Again, it's 10,000 um, square feet of sprawling indoor wow. and outdoor state-of-the-art space. So we just invite create, and it's a community space. This is not, you know, a one village alliance, you know, space where we're keeping the doors closed and talking about everything we're doing and that we have. These doors are open, they've been open. We secured this um, uh, building two days before the pandemic shut down here in Delaware. Oh, okay. And um, it's, we've continued to keep it open, providing essential resources and we couldn't have done it without a large collaborative. So we have back office space for small businesses and entrepreneurs. We have studio and gallery space for artists. We have walls, we have an outdoor, um, um, stage area. We have a gazebo, a, a huge yard. We're doing vertical gardens outside. It's just an amazing opportunity for anyone who's ever wanted to do any work um, throughout the city of Wilmington. That, 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 is, that, that, that is so awesome. Uh, before we, we move into one of your other big major programs, Girls Can Do Anything, um, in terms of the Raising Kings Conference, uh, you have some dynamic speakers. You yes, those, you know, who facilitated uh, dynamic uh, workshops. Um, now, do, do, do the brothers, do, do they come to you and say, hey, Sandra, I want to be part of this? Or, or, or do you uh, do random calls and say, hey, I want you to be part of this? How do you do that? How do you organize uh, it? I am very glad you asked. These are brothers who not only come to me and say, how can we be a part of it? But they're brothers that have been working with us in the community throughout you know, our 10 years in existence, many of them. Um, so a lot of people look at the poster like, why didn't you pick me? Why didn't you pick me? No, we want you to pick us, pick our young kids, pick this initiative to be a part of, and we'll happily put you on the poster, on our website, but more importantly, put you in a, a really um, high impact role in, in a relationship building space with young men and boys um, and even girls. This is all about, you know, when we think about Kings, a lot of people think about men and boys, but we're talking about raising the next generation of Dr. King-like leaders. And while it is critically important that we build our black men up and our Hispanic men up, we wanna make sure that um, it's very inclusive. Um, in particular, we have a whole track for mothers raising sons. So yes, we want men to reach out, but let me run down the schedule really quick. If you want to follow sure. along, it's at IamTheVillage.org. Um, so we have our day of service again. I had to talk about our kickoff, really exciting here at the Freedom Center. And um, you can register again at IamTheVillage.org. That's January the 18th. We also have another exciting project on the 18th in the afternoon. So in the morning, we're gonna start out with the day of service. At two o'clock, we're gonna to transition to the community education building. Yes, we just received um, that confirmation today. So really exciting announcements happening tonight on this live, Brother Omar. But there's a great team, um, Isan, Miss Joanne, who's over there. And we're gonna do a Be Him image celebration. Traditionally, um, this has been an award celebration that happens at the African American Heritage Center here in Wilmington. But we're going to do this celebration of the imagery of beautiful black men, fathers, families, sons. And we're gonna do that right at the community education building in a way that's in line with the governor's um, you know, guidelines and restrictions for gathering. So small groups, but we're inviting men from all over to come and be a part of this photography project. Be Him stands for, it's hashtag B-H-I-M, and it stands for Black History in the Making. So while we're celebrating Dr. King and great leaders who came before us, um, Peter Spencer and the like, we want to recognize young leaders, history in the making, like yourself, Brother Omar, that's happening right now, leading in journalism and mental health and wellness and healing. So we're inviting men, boys from all walks of life to meet us on January 18th for our Be Him Image celebration. Most importantly, we need photographers, videographers, male, female, from any background, any walk of life. We're inviting the whole community of photographers to come and be a part of this explosive um, celebration and capturing 
Um, I, I really have to give a shout out to Ray Rhodes at the Christina Cultural Arts Center. Mm -hmm. He's been leading that organization phenomenally. He's already committed to do a, um, an exhibition of the images of beautiful men and fathers that we're gonna capture on that day. So we're excited. The Delaware Art Museum has committed to doing an exhibition. So this is something that we anticipate will go viral and far and wide. And again, we'll be gathering um, predominantly outside at the community education building, but also having some time where we have so many powerful, phenomenal, um, men and boys together in one space will be gathering inside in um, groups of 10 or less in different spaces throughout the community education building. So that's a really new partnership that we're um, really thrilled about this year. Um, okay. And that's all, that's all just day one. Wow. Yeah. And okay. then um, January 20th, which is that Wednesday, we have something called Kings in the Kitchen brand new partner. It's a health conversation that's going to be hosted at Eat Clean Delaware by Brother Camille Bass, who's over there, just an extraordinary business leader and business owner. Um, and someone when, you know, whenever we hear these narratives about Black men don't value health, and we're at the bottom of every, you know, the, the top of every health disparity, um, when it comes to all of these negative statistics, right? When it comes to health and men. So we have individuals like um, David Miller, who's going to be talking about men's health. We have five men coming together. Um, Camille Bass, Tell Davis, who's a Hall of Fame athlete here in, um, in the state of Delaware. We have um, Dr. Ray Blackwell, who's been involved in this initiative from the very beginning. And um, just, just a great panel of men. And that's all gonna be a live streamed conversation over some acai bowls and smoothie bowls and fresh pressed juice that Camille is gonna be leading the men in, in preparation of. And they're gonna just kind of be enjoying some of that um, you know, healthy food and drink together. A lot of people talk about masks, but it's, you know, any doctor will tell you that a mask can't save you and you can't just lock yourself in. You have to build your immune system. And we want um, we want our men to lead the discussion and how they're building their immune system, keeping themselves mentally strong. Um, John Cook, I want to remember to mention him. Phenomenal mental health um, professional here in the state of Delaware. And um, just mentally, physically, spiritually, keeping ourselves and our families healthy. So to hear men, fathers, doctors, business leaders from um, the black community leading a conversation about that is gonna be really powerful. And I know you have an interest and a commitment to men's health as well and right. just being healthy all around. Yeah, yeah, I like working out, eating healthy. I'm a vegetarian, so, so that, that, that works out definitely for me. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, I know, I wish we could have an audience there, but definitely yeah. support Eat Clean. They are, I mean, it's yeah. the best fresh pressed juice and acai bowls in the entire region, and I've had a lot of them. Um, and then January 21st is the Lewis L. Redding Street Law Session, again, brought to us mm -hmm. by uh, Mr. Wally Rushden and the Black Barristers here in Delaware. Um, so, you know, we're talking about massive incarceration and just the whole process of engaging in the criminal justice system and staying out of the criminal justice system, how to engage effectively, and more importantly, how to choose to be a part of that system through um, a career as a barrister, a judge, a lawyer, um, you know, a Supreme Court justice, you know. Um, uh, yeah. So, a, a police off, a law enforcement officer. So that's going to be on the 21st and it's going to be largely virtual, but I want to shout out um, brother um, Doobie who has done a lot of work with our young teenage boys who, you know, are really at risk to these streets and they're going to be our live audience again, mm -hmm. keeping a very small socially distant group in person. Um, but you'll be able to see that live streamed. We have a fatherhood, the fatherhood fight, which is a film and panel discussion brought to us by CJ Bell. And that's going to be virtually accessible, but also right here at the Freedom Center. Uh, he did a film as a young single father about his own personal journey and honestly fight to um, be a great father. And we know a lot of our men and fathers, contrary to the popular narrative, a lot of our um, brothers are really out here fighting to be great dads. Um, 
And then we're going to end up with the Raising Kings Conference again, we'll, which will be accessible via live stream. Um, shout out to Darrell Green, who is continues to chair this remarkable event and was the first person to open the doors at PS DuPont Middle School. Um, Brandywine School District is still a key partner. Red Clay is a partner. And we want all of those youth to really be tuned in to the Raising Kings Conference. Again, we'll do a small audience in person, but largely virtual. And that wraps up Raising Kings Week, January 18th through the 23rd. And um, I'm just excited about everyone who's going to be there. It sounds great. And I'm so happy today that you're still happy despite the pandemic. I mean, you went, you're going virtual. And for the most part, but the bottom line is that you're still having it and people can still learn um, because this pandemic has closed businesses, uh, it has hurt nonprofits, but uh, One Village Alliance is still rolling. <laughs> it's not We're stopping. <laughs> we have to, and, and you know why? It's because, you know, we've been fighting hard for our community and a lot of our children and families have been living in a state of emergency long before um, a yeah. pandemic affected a much broader community. So with the resources for that other community, um, there's been a lot of new resources in our neighborhoods. And, you know, we are one of the few organizations that was able to keep our doors open, providing meals daily. We have um, winter coats. Uh, we have learning pods. We have support and resources, you know, school supplies. Um, high speed internet access, we were well prepared. They say when you, um, when you, you know, stay ready, you never have to get ready. So did we have to do a lot more work and fight a lot harder? We absolutely did. Right. Um, the first response from our funders was like, okay, we're, we're ceasing to fund all organizations. We're pulling our funding back, even funding that we were in the middle of. And right. we said, Hey, wait a minute. This is not a, the state of emergency is not new for our family. So I just want to recognize all of those funders and donors and supporters who have been vital. Um, we have people who make a $20 contribution a month. That is enough to literally provide food for a family. We provide pop-up groceries, you know, right. for an entire month. So we have individuals who give at the $200 level, to $2,000 level, to $20 level. And we would not be here um, without all of those people who said, you know what, we are going to listen. You know, we can't just all stay home and, and be on Zoom. We've got real families with real lives living in a real state of real crisis mm -hmm. and who have real needs and, and growing needs. So um, we yeah, think- like you just said, like you said uh, people, I was watching the news earlier, you know, people losing jobs and there are people who for the first time in their lives who, who are in need of uh, food baskets. So and this, this is what, what you're doing. You're feeding the community and you're providing some support for the community. So, I mean, and the children, they, they still got to live there. They still got to learn. They still need mentors. And it's, you know, it's because of the pandemic don't mean, like you said, the world's going to stop. So yeah, I definitely take my hat off to, to, to One Village Alliance. Um, so let's move to Girls Can Do Anything because you work with uh, teenage girls every year. You, you have your little uh, pajama party and you have your little uh, seminars and <laughs> talk about the uh, Girls Can Do Anything. What's, what's that I, about? I'm so excited. You know, I'm a girl. We're all on the girl. All of us phenomenal females are, are along the girl spectrum and we have so much fun. It's, it's so much different than engaging the men and boys. You know, we really got to work at y'all, you guys, and we need our men. So register yeah, yeah. and sign <laughs> up at, um, at IamTheVillage.org. Shoot us a message, contact us, or give us a call at 855-UPD. But on to our girls. Um, we have an extraordinary committee. The Girls Can Do Anything conference happened in person, live here at the Freedom Center um, in October. Mm -hmm. And I'm so excited about a national partnership um, that we have launched. I wanna, again, I gotta shout out David Miller, who's been so instrumental in launching a, helping us to launch a global mentoring platform. So we're developing that and that's how we're keeping our girls engaged. So Girls Can Do Anything is all about, you know, redefining womanhood and what it means to be a girl. So we see the Nicki Minaj's and the Beyonce's and the Cardi B's and they're living their dream. But then when we look at our girls, based on the image that they're portraying, it looks like they're all living the same dream. Everybody's hair's alike, their makeup's with the eyelashes, it's, it's all the same. 
we want to really meet our girls in a space of who are you? Not, not who you want to be when you grow up. We'll have that conversation as well, but who are you now? And lay out a plan for them that really keeps, sets a course for them and keeps them on course. Bridging the fatherhood gap, building relations between relationships between mothers and girls, and most importantly, introducing girls to images other than pop culture and social media. Real women and girls who are behind the scenes, they're not um, on TV and on radio and on the computer screen and on their smart smartphones, um, but we wanna bring those images to light. So phenomenal females like Dallas, the science diva, who's an extraordinary scientist, um, you know, there's Dr. Serena, who's a who's a physician with Christiana Care. Um, there's so many phenomenal females who are just out here doing great work. Sharice Monique, who started Ram Role Model Society. Um, so those are the women. So we have these What's Up Wednesday live conversations that have been led by Sharice Monique again all throughout the pandemic. And now any girl anywhere, and this goes for our young kings as well, um, can connect with phenomenal female role models. And in the case of the Kings, awesome um, men and fathers and mentors and right from their smartphones, take a break from scrolling through social media and get involved in our Girls Can Do Anything virtual mentoring program. Um, so we're excited about that. And again, I am the village.org complete the contact us form or give us a call directly at 855-YOUTH-ED and um, find out how to get involved with Girls Can Do Anything. Uh, let me ask you a two-point follow-up question, uh, two-part follow-up question with the Girls Do Anything. Um, a, what, what type of feedback have, have you received from, from the young ladies who participated in, in, in the conference and, and the Girls Do Anything? And B, has any of them, now they may be like 24, 25, that came back to, to, to be a mentor for, for the upcoming young ladies? Yes, they have. Mm -hmm. Our girls have come back. They have stayed involved. Um, you know, I'm, I'm looking across to the other desk now. I have one of my um, phenomenal female interns um, who's now a teenager with us, who's doing a lot of our social media, marketing and administrative support. Um, we have girls on our planning committee committee and that's been you know probably the past three years we've really seen our girls who have now outgrown the program and um i mean outgrown you know grown through the program and right. now are still participating in that intergenerational some are, are my personal mentees you know drea and genesis and sophia but also are coming back um ayana uh just so many um yeah, K Caitlin, these are all young women who have now been facilitators to work with One Village Alliance, but also lead in um, leading Girls Can Do Anything workshops and program development. So that's a great question. I'm, I'm glad you asked about those girls. Now, now what, what are the age requirements uh, for, for a young lady to join the Girls Do Anything uh, program? So it's it's age nine and up. And I want to tell you the feedback from the Girls Can Do Anything conference. Oh, we sure, had sure. reduced attendance to 30, uh, 20 to 30 girls at that time back in October. Every single one of them stayed from beginning to end. They absolutely loved it. We provided branded Girls Can Do Anything masks, which are available on our website. Every one of them got a Girls Can Do Anything t-shirt. We had bags sponsored by one of our partners. They left with just gifts. Um, and they said, can we do this every week? So that was the feedback. This has been awesome. It, it really was a boost for their spirit, their mental health. I mean, at that point, you know, from March, April, May, June, July, August, September, they had already been in quarantine for nearly seven months. And our girls, our youth need to be socially connected. And that gave them a great opportunity to do that in a really, um, a really safe manner. Uh, Liberty Bell with Love Liberty Philly was here. Um, we just had phenomenal females from all throughout the region and girls from all over the state of Delaware. Shout out to Delaware Humanities who continues to fund that work. Now, sorry, uh, you correct me if I'm wrong, but, but didn't, didn't you expand 
is, is it part of your program somewhere in Africa? Yes, we got an, we we received an Obama Foundation grant in 2018. Wow. We used that funding to take um, a cohort of Girls Can Do Anything ambassadors to West Africa. We built a sisterhood with two organizations since 2018, actually so many more, but we have two anchor organizations who are leading Girls Can Do Anything Ghana in West Africa. Uh, Teresa Anafi, I wanna give you a special thank you, our 2019 partner, Rita, um, from Feminine Star Africa, um, Teresa from She Dreams Africa have just been extraordinary pillars and women and ambassadors for Girls Can Do Anything. And we are now in more than 240 schools with the Girls Can Do Anything curriculum in West Africa. And with this global, with the launch of this global mentoring platform, we're only going to um, grow our global presence. So we've already been to Cuba and Puerto Rico and Mexico, um, West Africa, and we're going to continue to grow that presence, build partners throughout the United States and um, on every continent. We already touched every continent through our summer program, but um, I'll share a little bit more about that later. But yes, thank you for bringing up our global expansion into Africa. It was such a spiritual, purposeful, high impact journey. So, so uh, at what point did you decide that, that you want to go like worldwide, you want to be global? Because you start here in Delaware, and I think you got a branch in Jersey, if I'm correct, right? Somewhere yes, we do. So, so, yeah. so, 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 so did you just sit back behind your desk one day and say, you know what? I want to go to Africa. I want to go to Europe. I want to go to Jamaica. I want to go anywhere. <laughs> Honestly, I was born to be worldwide. I meet people okay. today without a passport. You know, my son got a passport. I mean, right. he started traveling when he was under two and could take advantage oh, of the free okay. flight. Travel, world travel has always been um, a strong value in my family. We've always traveled, you know, there was, I have seven brothers and sisters. My parents would load us in a caravan, a van, a, a motor home. And if we had to drive cross country, um, which we did, we drove cross country to Mexico, you know, several times and throughout the United States. and. Um, have always had a great appreciation for world cultures. Um, we celebrate that through music and food and friends and expand our network. You know, that's how you defeat racism and classism and all of these isms, just through a real love for global humanity and appreciation. And that, that starts with exposure, awareness, and understanding. So I, I was born into travel and I always knew that while Del the Delaware Valley provided really fertile ground for us to plant a seed for an organization such as this. We knew that um, this was just a pilot and in a very short amount of time, well before our timeline, um, we were gonna expand outside of this area across the nation and um, around the world. And we're, we're well on our way through that journey. And not every organization can say that they can do that. I mean, that, 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 is, that is amazing. I mean, that is truly amazing. Okay, Suitable Men, what's Suitable Men? Suitable Men um, actually gave birth to Raising Kings. So our Suitable oh, Men, man. many of the individuals, Her Broadwater, Gerald, Calvin, these brothers, um, you know, first we have to build our men. And that's arguable, you know, many would think of, Frederick Douglass, you know, and, um, you know, first building the children, but we need, you know, it truly does take a whole village to raise a child and our men and fathers are a vital partner and um, lifeline in our village. So Suitable Men um, is still a place where adult men can come for resources like man-to-man -man mentoring, professional attire, um, entrepreneurship and wealth building support and um, economic empowerment, job skills training and job placement. Um, and then again, Raising Kings was really an outgrowth of now that we have these extraordinary men that we've been building since 2010, these are the men, 
you know, David Miller was a part of leading that program. These are the men who are now reaching. It's all about the next generation. This is tribal leadership. This is intergenerational growth. You know, it's the birth of a new generation. It's nation building, you know, as Nelson Mandela talked about. That's that's our that's our approach. A lot of people call it, you know, a lot a lot of different things, you know, um, the, the three generation approach approach, but it's it's really intergenerational, holistic, and we cannot do it without whole families. So All right. you know, last week I, I did a part one of a series called Growing Up in the Inner City and um one of the things that grew up in the conversation was you talked about the village. Um, how, how do you respond to those who say, well, Sandra, there, there's a more village. You know, we, we don't know our neighbors. We, we don't look after ourselves. We, we, we don't speak to one another. There is no more community. I'm raising your child. You're raising my child. Matter of fact, if you correct a child, the parent might want to fight you. <laughs> so uh, how do you respond to those who say, you know, that the village no longer exists? So it's so interesting the questions you're asking. The reason I started One Village Alliance is because I heard that exact quote. Oh, wow. And I remember who said it. I, I won't say it right now, but <laughs> he said the village no longer exists. What I would say is come join us and let's build it back up together. Let's build it. So many people need that village want to be a part of the village, want to make an impact, but maybe you're like, I'm just one person. But together as a collective, as a unified organization, as one village alliance, we can bring that village back. And we're doing that right here. Um, I mean, I just think of the community that's building in here. We have already Dr. Idris Clymer and another awesome elder who's working here, housed here at the Freedom Center. Um, developed a whole martial arts studio and his primary lead instructor is a 13 year old black girl who's a black belt. She's oh, extraordinary. We're seeing that village. We have families, mothers and sons and daughters in the same martial arts class learning and growing and connecting and being a part of family together. We have um, as many as 40 students, again, not all at one time, but throughout the week. You know, we have our Freedom Fellows. It's a fellowship of 25 young people that we've built relationship with since the summer. They now have extraordinary mentors and connections to people that, you know, they never had a, you know, we, we don't, they're not just mentors, they're lifelines. So we're making these vital connections throughout community. And um, it's just really important that we create opportunities for people to be the village, you know, be a part of the village, foster that village, not just with us, but in your own community. Be a part of Raising Kings, reach down to other young men and boys, reach across to another father, you know, call them to at, into action. It's not calling them out, it's calling them into fatherhood. You know, be that mentor. You know, our girls can do anything. We're building sisterhood, you know. Um, we're raising the next generation of, of really dope girls and leaders and social justice advocates, you know, um, and, you know, warriors. It's There's so much excitement in just connecting. But one great first step is to visit our website, contact us, call us, or reach out to somebody in your own family who you may think, because they're on the video game all the time, they're not paying attention to you and don't need you, but but reach out. Right, right. You know, I've interviewed guys like uh, Duffy Samuels, who has a strong passion to work with, with the youth, as you did, as you do currently. I'm going to ask you the same question that I asked him and others. Um, you know, I, I take so much admiration for those who, who work with the youth, because not only you, you're dealing with the youth, but, but you have to deal with their parents or their guardian. You're dealing with issues that they deal with at home, issues that they deal with at school. Um, just talk about your passion as to why you decided to take the route and work with young people? I've always been really compassionate for young people. You know, I'm not sure what Duffy's story is, but many of us who have such a passion, it comes from our own personal experiences um, of, you know, some form of abuse, 
um, some challenge, bullying, um, trauma. So I bring those experiences, um, but I also bring a high level of assets um, and affirmations that saved my life and let me know who I was from, the, from early on, not just from inside of my household, but in the community. You know, but I also remember being in a place where I was getting things from inside my household and in the community that I needed to be rescued from. And I remember what it felt like not to have a one person to call on. So I've had really great experiences, really um, difficult experiences, extreme love, um, abuse. And I learned from all of those things and understood the purpose they all shaped me into the leader that I am today. And I'm still working to become a better person myself. I tell people all the time, when you make a commitment to mentor, to advocate, to volunteer, a lot of people say, well, you can change someone's life, but the life that is most changed is your own. It's right. the most rewarding um, 40 hours that you could commit. Um, and it's not 40 hours a week. It's just 40 hours a year. Um, mm -hmm. and it's, it's truly rewarding, but I come to this space because there's a calling on my life. It's my purpose. I, I inspire others to follow their purpose and their calling and to not be fearless, but in the face of your fear, be courageous and to keep going because there are children from here to Africa and across the world, or maybe just on your, in your own block or in your own household, in your own family that are waiting for you to do what you've been called to do, what you were born to do, so. Now, I'm quite sure that, that, that on numerous occasions, you probably had young people come to you and say, Miss Sandra, thank you for changing my life, or you may have their parents came to you and say, you know, I really see a difference in my child's life since he or she's been working with you. Um, how does that make you feel inside? It's the, again, this is the most rewarding. <laughs> thankless, thankless. <laughs> but hands down, you know, one of the things I appreciate about our funders and our partners is, you know, we have to document the impact you know, and we have to get these surveys and our children and, and their parents and their teachers are excited to fill them out. Sometimes we have just check boxes. Yes, yes, yes. It was great, great, great. But other times people will write a sentence, you know, I wish I had one of those sentences in front of me, but, and sometimes people will flip the page over and write paragraphs. And sometimes we'll get a call or a, or a beautiful DM or message on Facebook from someone that Maybe we don't even remember that individual encounter, but it's those moments that are just, that make it all worth it. Right, right. And in the, in, in the times where sometimes we're fighting for people who not only are not fighting for themselves, but they're fighting against us. You know, sometimes our own community is fighting against us, fighting against each other but it's it's those moments where you realize that you have impact you have made a, an impact that's going to out outlive yourself and that's the definition of legacy right right um now also i, I see you uh, on some live facebook uh posts that um you, you're also a community activist I, I see you protesting you got the bullhorn shouting <laughs> um you fight for social justice um uh, what, what, is your, what is your opinion or uh, stance on the Black Lives Matter movement and, um, and, and why have you been involved with community activism? My opinion is that Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. I'm involved because Black Lives Matter. Um, we say it because we have to say mm -hmm. Black Lives Matter. We live in that kind of country and that kind of world. Mm -hmm. So the opinion, the truth is that Black Lives Matter. And I'm out here because we have to be. I mean, we have to be. We're, we're living in cities, you know, when you think about Salem, New Jersey and Wilmington, Delaware and Dover 
and, you know, throughout the state, Philadelphia, look all around us, Chester. In the last few months, I mean, we've broken the homicide record, the gun violence record, mm -hmm. more than once just in the past year. Um, and we're not talking about some foreign land war. That's, that's bad. We're talking about 10 and 12 year old teenage little girls, boys, children, are, you know, fathers. We're talking about people who are being, um, lives that are being taken without care, um, a disparate um, resources, economic development happening at the, at the intentional exclusion of our neighborhoods and communities. Um, egregious injustice and trauma. I mean, we're talking about children dying. Some a quick death to a bullet, others a slow death. When we look at massive incarceration, we're talking about nonviolent offenders. Eric Smith, you know, Mamas Behind the Masses was is an initiative that is newly launched this year by uh, Heidika Booker here with One Village Alliance and 20 some year old kid, the amount of drugs that's in his pocket, simple possession, one count. But because he's a multiple multiple offender, this three strikes, right. yeah. he, is look, he, he has been convicted and we have kids incarcerated for minor crimes, victimless crimes, yes, I said it, for life, a life sentence. So now we have the def devastation of that young person's life, the life of his mother, his sister, his children, everyone who cared about him in the community, times millions and millions and millions of young black and brown men. On the other hand, well, some people would argue, well, if you do something bad, then you're a criminal and you deserve to be thrown away. But uh, we have this white woman over here who murdered her two-year-old child, was convicted of murdering her two-year-old child, got a seven-year sentence, did three years and was released. Wow. We have no mandatory minimums for rape. We have no mandatory minim minimums for taking a life. There is no mandatory minimum for, you name the violent crime. So there's only egregious injustice and race and oppression when we think about the cycle of how this war on drugs and war on poverty and war on the black community. Um, when we think about the laws that are in effect that protect um, violent criminals who are police officers. Um, and then people feel the need to say, oh, police officers aren't bad. If you have to make that statement, that in itself is a, is a statement. Um, you know, we have death sentences being carried out, you know, um, unjustly when we, we know that they're problematic. So there's so many injustices that we have to I mean, if it, you have to ask yourself for anyone who feels like protesting is wrong um, and looting is wrong and breaking glass and buildings in our own communities, none of these buildings do we own, um, particularly here in Wilmington, Delaware. While we have some black business owners who are leasing some spaces downtown, that ain't the neighborhood that we've been, we're still being strategically kept out of these spaces. So you have to ask yourself, what would you do if it was, I'm not gonna wait till it's Jalil, my son. I'm gonna be out here when it's someone else's son, when it's someone else's daughter. I have to care at that point. And we have to be in protest. Protest is not an event that you make a sign for and show up and then you go home. Protest is a state of being, and we have to protest injustice, and we need to get united with one agenda. Um, and again, reach out to us, find out what that agenda is. It exists, and we, you know, silence is a form of violence. So ask yourself, what side 
of this line are you on? Because there's a hard line between justice and injustice. So it, do you care more about looting buildings and break, broken glass and, you know, broken body, you know, than you do about broken bodies and broken mother's hearts and black bodies bleeding out and broken spirits and broken hope. They've been looting our lives for a very long time. And no one showed up like they showed up downtown Wilmington for some broken glass. Right. The governor, our president elect, our senators, I mean, council people. Everyone shows up when you break glass. But who's showing up for these broken children's bodies and broken mothers' hearts that we're seeing every single day in this city? Right. So ask yourself, what are you most troubled by? And then how tro are you troubled enough to get up and do something or call me and ask what you can do? Right. Yeah, I want to take this opportunity for you to talk about your staff. And I, I know you threw a lot of names in earlier, some, some, some good names, but, but, but your staff, I mean, as awesome as your organization is, I mean, you can't do the work alone. I'm quite sure you have an awesome staff. Um, so if you want to give a, take this time to acknowledge those who are in your organization that it helps make one of those lines a great organization. I, I started doing that a long time ago, Brother Omar. All of those <laughs> individuals' names, um, you know, many are on my board now. They're our yeah. team, our staff, our key leaders. You know, I mentioned, yeah. you know, Darrell Green is, is our community chair. I mentioned, you know, Calvin Harmon, Daryl Andrews, his daughter, Sophia, um, right, right. my Freedom Fellows, my intern. Um, <laughs> there's Every person that I've named is, I could not do it without one of those people. And I don't think I left anybody out, but you know, okay. I, right. I, I know I left so many people out. I don't know why I, I misspoke. You know, Isaiah is our, you know, our OVA, you know, photographer. Um, Isaiah Boone, he's extraordinary. Oh gosh, you know, I talked about Wally Rushton and David Miller. Um, there's so many extraordinary people that make this work happen. Um, I talked about Heidika Booker, you know, these are my team members whom I could not do it without. I'm searching, like, did I forget anybody? I mean, yeah. every, even new team members, you know, Miss Joanne, she's phenomenal. Her passion is unmatched. Um, I have, the most dynamic, powerful, loyal, committed team. And those team members remain. And um, I'm, I'm in a space of extreme gratitude right now for the people that I've had around, you know, even my team members in Africa who lead the work, Rita and Teresa. So I could not have gotten an hour into this interview without naming every one of my team members. Great, great. Um, now, now are, are you hiring more, more workers? Oh, yes, yes, yes. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. <laughs> we are building our team. We're hiring. Uh, we're hiring a community impact curator. We're hiring um, a special projects director. We have some contracts available, particularly around social media management, um, event planning. So I'm excited. And we need a bookkeeper, um, somebody who could provide some administrative program support. So we have so many opportunities. We just got um, a new grant announcement last week. So thank you to the Longwood Foundation, um, to the Foreman Acton Educational Foundation, to all our funders and supporters, Delaware Humanities, who have already talked about. And yes, we are hiring. And you know, one thing we know is that our organization is. Um, we're still in our infancy stage. There's so much opportunity and room for growth here. There's so much opportunity and room for learning, for sharing, for supporting each other. So we need real people who are really committed to this real work, you know. Um, now, um, uh, in terms of the hiring process, uh, where can we want people to email their resumes and mail them to you? How, they how email their resume to apply, A-P-P-L-Y, at IamTheVillage.org. That's apply at IamTheVillage.org. Um, and that would be most appreciated. Mm -hmm. 
um, if people could just send right there. I'd like to encourage people to follow us on Instagram at the number one in the word village because we have the positions posted there okay, on our Facebook you. page at One Village Alliance. Um, follow our work. We'll be posting some new positions over the next week, but we're hiring like right, right now. I have some, I had some exciting interviews today. I have some great dope people in the office and we've been doing some work all day today and um, we've got some interviews tomorrow. So there's, once we put the word out there, like there's so many creatives and leaders and dope individuals and young people who have started their own companies who are saying, you know, we want to, um, we'd love to work with you contractually. So I'm excited. That's awesome. Now, now, now you, you won uh, some, some awards. <laughs> I know you won, won one recently. So let's talk about some of your awards before, before you end the program where we got to give you your props. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm really honored at, you know, the work in and of, of itself. It, it is not easy. It's difficult, but it's well worth following your dream, following your calling and your purpose. Um, I have, I have been recognized. Um, I'm always kind of like, wow, they see me. Like, I just feel like I'm like, I'm still in the office. It's eight o'clock at night. Like, how do they know? Where do they see me? But, you know, it's become clear that our work really does speak for itself. Um, so I'm just, I'm always honored and humbled when I'm recognized. Um, some things that stand out are the NAACP. We received a Youth Impact Award. I was recently selected. Right, right. Um, yeah, by the um, Delaware Today, Delaware Business Times as a Woman in Business of the Year. That was exciting. I'm the youngest person in Delaware's Hall of Fame for women. I'm excited. I'm excited. Awesome. That's awesome. So as we conclude the program, I ask you a two part, well, one part question and then a final comments. Um, who are the, I know people look at you, um, other women may look at you and say, Sandra is my, my role model, she's my mentor. Um, who, who are some of the women that, 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 that you look up to as being a mentor for you? And then um, any closing comments you wanna make in terms of the upcoming programs, how the people can reach you and the website once again? Yeah, um, some of my mentors, I'm just stalking. They don't even know that I'm their mentee, <laughs> I'm like a stalker. But I have to, the moment you say mentor, uh, Senator Margaret Rose Henry, she's played such a significant role in believing in a girl with a dream. Girls can do anything happen because of her. Of course, I have to recognize my mom. And, you know, even in her passing, um, she gave her life to this work, um, Marion um, Brown Henson. Mm -hmm. um, still her life and her legacy she was her she was my mentor when she, when she was alive and um she fought cancer fiercely and her legacy still has a great impact in my life you know david miller and calvin harman mm -hmm. daryl andrews i'm yeah. so blessed to have so many extraordinary people in my life. I'm still learning from my father who also passed. Um, and one thing I wanna say to the, the leaders, um, reach back to our generation. We need you all, you know? Uh, you should be nurturing and cultivating and raising us up just as we are the generations coming after us. So, um, Particularly, yeah. So I will just I will just say that we, um, as women, we need each other, and I I truly appreciate Senator Margaret Rose Henry for always being one of our elders who does that with a pure heart. Um, and yeah. Okay. So. It. All right, great. So so one more time, give your website information. Uh, any any closing comments you want to make? Our website is www.iamthevillage.org. I can put it in the comments. I'd love for you all, I have a, a teen intern, my Freedom Fellow. She hit me up at 7.30 this morning. I just gave her the project of managing our social media and she wanted to get our Instagram followers up. And she, she texted me 
And she said, Miss Chandra, did you see we have 12 new followers? So make her day and follow us on Instagram, the number one in the word village. Um, follow us on One Village Alliance Facebook page. We'll be posting all of our event schedule with the registration link for Raising Kings. We'll be po posting our launch for our mentor orientation for Girls Can Do Anything and Raising Kings. We're launching a global mentoring program. You can mentor a girl in Africa. You can mentor a girl in Cuba, Puerto Rico, or Mexico. Um, peers can mentor each other through that platform. And um, my closing remarks would just be like, follow your dream, tune into your purpose. Don't feel, um, don't hesitate to reach out to someone for help advice, guidance, um, but invest in yourself first. You only need one person to believe in you and that person is not you. You have to do more than believe, you have to know. Know who you are um, and know what your purpose is. And, you know, seek out mentors and seek out support. You know, don't get caught up in social media trying to make it look like you're living your best life. There's your best life is waiting to be lived by only you. So, and everybody who's already living it, like keep going. This work is not easy. So um, let's be stronger. Let's support each other more. Let's have more grace with each other and more understanding and communicate you know, directly with each other and understand that people are doing their best and commit to doing your best at any given moment and just keep going. Okay, great. Awesome. All right, Sandra. So it was an awesome interview. Uh, thank you for being a guest. Um, I'm sure we will come back together again. Is there any other uh, further uh, follow-up? I'm so excited and I look forward to seeing all of you for Raising Kings. Um, extreme gratitude to my entire team, everyone who's donated, contributed, volunteered, and also for always, always supporting myself and One Village Alliance. Thank you so much to you, Brother Omar Rashada. No problem. Thank you. All right. I'd like to thank everybody for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and share, and I will see you next time. See you, Sandra. Take care. Good night. Thank you.